but uh, <laughs> good to see you tonight, brother. Good to have you here. All right, well, we had a good day today, amen? amen. All you fathers, you look happy. Your wife cooked you a meal for once, amen? And, uh, but it was good. I appreciate, uh, appreciate my son. Could you turn me up a little bit, please? Thank you. I appreciate uh, all of the, um, the efforts on the part of my kids to try to make me, to make me happy. Um, they failed for so many years, but uh, they're, they're trying now. So anyway, I appreciate, appreciate my son Rocky. He's sick tonight, but uh, he took me out this afternoon and, and uh, took care of me and paid the bill. That's a miracle. I thought the day of miracles was over, but uh, man, that's... That's uh, right up there. That made me want to talk in tongues. And uh, anyway, Brother Eric, good to see you. Good to have you back and with your two sons. God bless you, brother. It's good to, I know you're happy. It's good to see you. All right. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4. A few weeks ago, I preached a message on the... Uh, why churches do not grow and how they can grow. And uh, there, you've got to keep in mind that there is not one thing you can do to make a church grow. A mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> fellow goes out and he goes soul winning and gets a lot of folks saved. And God says, well, I guess I ought to give him some sense so he'll know how to get it organized and how to work with those people. And uh, it's hard to have balance in any part of your life for any of us, and uh, <clears throat> we just seem to think that there's one thing that'll make a church grow, but uh, there isn't. It's a multitude of things, and, and I, as I preached a few several weeks ago, I mentioned to you that the glue that holds a church together is the cement that keeps other people out. Now, nobody does that intentionally. It's, it's just ignorance on our part. But the average church in America has 47, uh, has, uh, uh, I think, uh, 78, or I forget what the figure is, 87, has 87 people in Sunday morning. The average church in America has 87 people in the Sunday morning service, 87. Now, if that's the average, that tells you that there are a few mega churches, as Brother Chapels, Brother Hiles, and a few like that, but most churches, well, if that's, if that's the average, you know what's on the bottom side. You're looking at churches, 15, 20, 30, 40 people. And uh, there are a lot of churches like that. There's no excuse for a church like Open Door Baptist Church, right in the middle, right in the heart of thousands of people, to be running less than 100 and several hundred. Uh, we could. Dr. John Rawlins, when he was here, he met with, my, with Pastor Kelly, Pastor Rich, and myself, and he said, this church right now, with the number of adults that it has, right now, with the number of adults, you don't need any more adults to do this, but he says, you ought to be running no less than 600. And it should be. And it can be. And it will be if we do the right things. Now, I was with Larry Chapel, talking about Larry Chapel. I was with Larry Chapel in Korea. I preached for him. And uh, I, I'll never forget a statement I made. I says, uh, I, I can see that you are really having to work hard here in Korea. And he said to me, Brother Blue, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you have to work smart. Now hard work is important, but it, it won't get the job done if it isn't smart work. Mm -hmm. You understand? Amen. I mean, you can work your fingers to the bone, but if you don't do the right thing, and uh, uh, I'll never forget a uh, fellow down in California who's a head of a church growth institution. He said, churches are not built by wonderful pastors. A lot of folks say, but my pastor's so wonderful. Well, that's nice, but that's not what builds great churches. It is not wonderful pastors who build big churches or great churches. It is pastors doing the right things. Do you know you didn't have to be saved to build a big church? Right. Think about it. Think about it. A lot of folks that don't even preach the gospel 
And of course, we try to alibi ourselves and say, well, the reason we don't have anybody is we preach the truth. But then we look at, look at Brother Chapel. Yeah. He preaches the truth. Jack Hiles preaches the truth. So you understand? Yeah. So we try to alibi and say, well, the reason we don't have anybody is because we stand for the King James Bible. That isn't true. Jack Hiles stands for the King James Bible. Has over 20,000 every Sunday. So you see these alibis all get shot in the head. It is not doctrine. It is not the Bible you choose. It's, that, that's not the key. That's not even the answer. It, the problem is many times we're not doing the right things. We're busy. We're busy. And we're fundamental. And, uh, and all of that. But we are not doing the right things. And I want to talk about that a little bit tonight. Uh, I mentioned last time that the cement or the glue that holds a group together is the cement that keeps other people out. Now a church, if you could think of a church of about 80 or 90 people as being a one-celled organization or organization, just a one-cell, that's just about what it is. In a church of 87 people, everybody knows everybody. They've got a wonderful pastor. He pastors all 87 people. They know him on a first name basis. He knows them on a first name basis. He counsels all of them. Uh, many times, he, uh, you know, he's the, there, there's one Sunday school class, one adult Sunday school class. He teaches it. They might have a teenage class, and then they have a children's ministry, and then a nursery. And that'll just about be it. But it's a wonderful little church because everybody knows everybody. It's just one little happy family. And it'll stay that way. And our folks love that. There are many folks that love that. And their goal is to keep all churches small so they can make sure that they know everybody and they know what's going on over at Mrs. Smith's and Mrs. Jones's. And, uh, uh, you know, and so that's, that's a mentality, that's a mindset. The only way a church like that's ever going to grow is it has to divide within the organization. It has to create another cell. It really has to create another church within that church. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, Brother Kelly... And, and Brother Rich are two of the finest staff members I've ever seen. And I'm an unusual guy. I've got two right-hand men. And I thank God for them. And uh, this guy right here pastors a church of about 100 people within this church. You see? And I believe, I have no doubt about it. I've already told him. I believe that he'll pastor 200 or more in this church. And I hope he does. I hope he can pastor 500 in this church. Really. I'm for him. And, of course, Pastor Sidlowski, he's new. He's been here less than a You've been here about a year, haven't you? But, you see, the same thing's true with him. He is a pastor of a group of Sunday school teachers and a, and a group of workers. He has to pastor those folks, you see. And you understand how it goes? So what you have to do is you have to get people within the congregation who can pastor. But the three of us still can't do it all, and that is not God's plan for us. The God's plan is that we all have a ministry within the local church. And if you look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, down about verse, uh, verse 11, we're talking about the church. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. He gave some for, to who? He gave them to the local church. In other words, the truth is, Brother Kelly is God's gift to this church. And, and uh, Brother Rich is God's gift to this church. And uh, I know, <laughs> hate to toot my own horn, but I am God's gift to this local church. And we have a job to do. We have, I, we, and we know, I, I, I believe we all know what our jobs are. And if we don't, we need to get together and clarify them. But uh, in chapter 4 and verse 12... It says that these men, in verse 11, that the evangelists and the apostles and the evangelists and the prophets and the pastors and the teachers are given to the local church, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Now, the word perfecting is maturing, building up. And the idea is that you become a stronger Christian. And... Uh, and then we are to help not only to build you up, to perfect you, to mature you, and, but the purpose is for the work of the ministry. Now, our job as pastors 
is to help you mature spiritually so that you can do the work of the ministry that you believe God wants you to do. That's what the text is saying. It is to prefer the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So my job as a pastor, Pastor Kelly and Pastor Rich's job as pastors, is to mature the people under them, that is to help them to grow, to nurture them, so that they, you, can do the work of the ministry, so that you can edify the body of Christ, the rest of the body. These folks over here ought to minister to these folks. These folks in the middle ought to minister to these folks. And that's the purpose. And uh, we, we need to understand that the, uh, the important work of the, ch of, the, uh, of the church, of the Lord's church, is to prepare each member of the body of Christ to do his or her part. Now, I, you know, I went through this thing for many years, and, and a lot of pastors, I think, that, that they see themselves, I guess, as cheerleaders. And I went through that for many years. And I, you know, I finally ran out of, uh, ran out of propane, pro, uh, fuel, trying to do that, trying to be the cheerleader. I find that if you can find people who love God and want to serve them, if you will give them the tools they need and the training they need, they are self-motivated in most cases. Now, occasionally, somebody gets in a slump. Occasionally, we get discouraged. Occasionally we have some disappointments and we need somebody to come in and encourage us and kind of, uh, you know, be peacemakers and build us up. But I would say 90% of the time, God's people do not need motivation. They need training. They need instruction. They need equipment and tools. Because if you love the Lord, you're motivated to serve Him anyway. Amen? Really. If you love Him, you're motivated. But just because you're motivated doesn't mean you're equipped or capable. Uh, Brother Jim's uh, been training police officers for years. These guys come in, if they're motivated, he doesn't have to motivate them. He has to give them the equipment and give them the training, give them the instruction. Sometimes, I'm sure, that they get discouraged. Sometimes there's problems and he has to step in and be a, kind of encourage them. And we all should do that. And, but. Uh, we need to understand that uh, the, most the most important part of the Lord's work is to prepare the minute. For instance, D.L. Moody said, I would rather train ten people to win souls than to win ten souls myself. It only makes sense to train people to win souls. They need to be trained. And thank God that Pastor Rich has been doing that and training folks in his soul winning training class, teaching you how to get into a home and how to present the gospel and how to draw the net and how to get a man or a woman saved and how to get them in church and get them in the baptistry. That, that's training and we have to have that. I saw recently in Sandpoint, I saw, uh, I, was, I told you about winning this man to the Lord, you know, and I saw a fellow who was highly motivated sitting beside me, a Christian who didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know what he was doing. He had, more, he had as much motivation or more than I did, and he, he was burdened, and he wanted to win this man to Christ. He didn't know what he was doing. He was just rambling and talking and going off at nowhere. I, when I won Steve Hackett to the Lord, I took a soul winner with me. And uh, we went to Steve's house. Steve had this big king crab, you know, uh, on his wall. The thing was about six feet long. And this soul winner that was with me, all he wanted to do is talk about fishing and talk about this crab. I wanted to shoot him. Every time I'd try to, to, to come to a pause in the conversation, trying to get some feedback from the center, this guy came in. So I figured what I was going to do. I thought, oh, buddy, I'll go back next week and I won't take you. You know, and that time I didn't. I, I went back and won Steve to the Lord myself, you see. Now, this guy, <clears throat> he just needed some more training, need to know when, to, when not to talk and so on. But you can talk yourself out. You can talk people out of getting saved. A fellow said to me, I, I tried to win him to Christ. He said, uh, I said, is that a president of the gospel? I said, does that make sense to you? He says, yeah, it does. I said, would you like to be saved? He said, I'd like to think about it. I said, okay. Why don't you think about it while I lead us in prayer? 
I'm not going to say, you think about it, I'll be back next week. He may be in hell. So I said, why don't you think about it, and I'll lead us in prayer. And I didn't say, you want to pray? I said, okay, let's pray. And I said, now, dear Lord, uh, help Carl here to think about it. He doesn't want to go to hell. I'm sure he's thinking about that. And he's going to die. Help him to think about that. And he has an appointment with God, and he doesn't know when. Help him to think about that. He wants to think about it. Now, Carl, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you would like to have Jesus as your Savior and you want to go to heaven when you die, just repeat this after me. Dear Lord, dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe Jesus died for me. And right now I'd like to receive him as my Savior. And it's silent. Uh, Carl, right now I'd like to receive him as my Savior. Right now I'd like to have you as my Savior. <laughs> and he started crying and booing and bawling. And he got saved. Amen. Now this guy over here on my right, he fumbled around for about 20 minutes. And I thought, if this guy goes on, this guy's going to go to hell. Now this guy had as much motivation as I have. He loved the Lord as much as I do. He didn't have proper training. That's the problem. A man and a woman who has proper training is motivated. Why? Because they become successful. And nothing motivates like success. Amen? And nothing discourages you like failure. So the real key for this young man and this young man and myself is to help you become a success in serving Jesus in the ministry you're in. That's, our, that's my job. That's their job. Now, you'll notice that the illustrating, or the, uh, the equipping of the saints is, first of all, and, and is, is uh, providential. That is, God has given to every Christian a abilities or gifts, and he has equipped every Christian to do what he wants them to do. You will usually... Uh, uh, migrate towards your interest and your interest will move in the area of your gifts. The fellow says, well, I couldn't be called to the ministry. I like it too much. You know, nonsense. Nonsense. I think if you're called into the ministry, you'll love it. I think if, you're, if you uh, have a particular area of gift, you, uh, you, love, what you, you love what you do. Uh, under most cases. So there is the providential side, and then, of course, there is the practical side. And the practical side is where every member ought to be trained and equipped and use their gifts that God has given them. And that's uh, what we find in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse, uh, verse 16. It says, referring to Christ, it says, from whom the whole body fitly joined together. Now that's the ideal, verse 16. The whole body fitly joined joined together. Brother Eric is a, is a craftsman. He makes, uh, he makes uh, handmade furniture, chairs, and tables. He's a craftsman. And uh, he takes his time and makes the cuts just right and measures and remeasures. He says it's better to measure twice and cut once than it is to measure one and cut twice. So he measures two or three times and then he cuts. And then he makes these pieces of wood join together to where you can't hardly see the cracks, you can't hardly see the seams. Now a good carpenter, a good craftsman can make brick and, and wood, things of that nature. I, I, man, I admire guys that can do that stuff. I honestly can't do anything with, like that with my hands. I give away hammers, but I sure can't, I can't do anything with a hammer. Um, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I don't want to get into that. But I admire guys that can do it. I admire people that can take a piece of wood and uh, make a masterpiece out of it. Or a craftsman who can take some cement or can take block and work with it. Man, I mean, that's, that is a unique, uh, an, an unusual task or ability. And uh, so God's plan in verse 16, for whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. 
And the idea here is that the, the joints and the body, the parts of the body, your physical body, that nothing is disjointed, that everything is put together in your body and uh, so that when you take in nourishment into your body, everything is working and every part of the body is getting the vitamins and the minerals and the thing it needs so that every part of your body is supplied. Now that is God's plan within a local church is that the pastoral leadership, the pastoral staff, train the membership so that the membership can supply to this part of the church what it needs and it can supply to this part of the church what they need and all working together works as a body in unity. And so the mistake sometimes that is made is and, and within a church and uh, is that there can't be this diversity. We want everybody to be like us. And uh, we want everybody to have the same gift we've got. We want everybody to be excited about the same ministry. You know, I don't care if you're excited about the same ministry I'm excited about. I want you to be excited about some ministry in the work of God, and I'll help you to do that part ministry. I don't care what it is. I don't have to be excited about the bus ministry. If they're excited, I'm going to help them get their job done. You understand? I don't have to have a burden for the bus ministry. I have a burden to help them get their job done. See, some folks think that you have to have the same burden they've got or you don't care. That's not the way it is. I don't have to run out here on Saturday and go calling with the bus people if I can just give them what they need and encourage them and help them get the job done that they believe God wants them to do. That'd be like me saying, well, I don't think you're excited about God if you don't come and sit in the Bible Institute on Thursday night. You understand? So my goal is to find out what you believe God wants you to do. And, uh, and then help you, equip you, and train you to do that ministry. And if we don't see this diversity, diversity within the body, body of Christ, we're headed for uh, stress and all kinds of problems. Now, notice, if you will, down in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and go back to the left of 1 Corinthians 12, and notice that the body of Christ has many members. And when we say members, we want to think about members like the members of your body. Um, look at 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter uh, 12 and look down at verse 12, the first part of verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, the body is one. You have ten toes, probably. Unless you're a carpenter, you got ten fingers, hopefully. And uh, but you've got ten toes and ten fingers. You got your arms, your legs, your eyes, your ears. You've got the members of your body. Many members, just one body. And when we see somebody, our first reaction when we see somebody with a finger missing, or a hand missing, or an ear, or an eye, or a leg, our first reaction obviously is. This person has something missing. It's not a whole body. You understand? That doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're worth less, but it just simply, right up front, there's something missing. And God has taken these members within the one body, your body, your physical body, and he's put them where they ought to be. Wouldn't a guy look funny if his ear was growing on a forehead? You know? or your nose was upside down, boy, in this country, you'd drown. But, but, so the physical body, just as the physical body has many members, and they're all different, so the local church has many members. Now, people who don't understand that and accept that and know how to work with that, they want to keep the body small. They don't understand the purpose and the function of the, of the, of the body of Christ. Look at verses, uh, verse 12 uh, and verse 14 as well. Chapter 12, verse 12. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 14. 
For the body is not one member, but many. And we have to come to the point to where we realize that the body of Christ is diverse. It has different likes, different temperaments, different personalities. And if you don't buy that, then your goal is going to be to whittle it down until everybody is just like you. You see? And that would be disastrous, wouldn't it? In chapter 12 of the book of Romans, he told the Romans the very same thing, the brethren at Rome. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and, uh, and look at verse 4, Romans 12, 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all of the uh, members have not the same office, okay, now we have many members. In your physical body, you have many members. But they don't have the same function, obviously. So we wouldn't expect within a local church, everybody within that local church to have the same function. I wouldn't expect everybody in this church uh, to do backflips over, over music. There are folks that are tone deaf. I like music. Most people do. But if you have tried to have special music and get a group together and get the, there are some folks that are not even going to give you a grunt. They're just not interested in it. Does that mean they're backslidden? Well, of course not. You try to have somebody that, uh, for the teaching, try to get somebody to teach a Sunday school class, there's always going to be someone, a group of people in that church, they have no interest in it, but they're, they're as right with God as anybody. I don't believe people are not are backslidden because they don't like what I don't like. And our natural tendency many times within church is we start things that we want and then we get angry at people if they don't become a part of it. Sometimes the best thing is just find out what the people of God want and then go in that direction. See? They're already motivated. A fellow comes to me and says, man, I got a good idea. They don't say this to me anymore. I got a good idea. I say, let's listen to it. That is a good idea. Obviously, God has impressed you with that. Would you be willing, under the leadership of God, to take over that and see that that works? Well, <laughs> most people will say yes. If they're sincere and they, they come to say, you know what I think we ought to have around here? I say, you know, I think we ought to have that too. And obviously, God has really impressed that upon you. He's burdened you. Well, preacher, don't you? I don't care. I'll help you. No, preacher, we wanted you to do it. Well, I don't have the burden. But you got the burden. I'm not going to stand in your way. You understand? I believe that's the way God works. It's much easier for me to help you with what's your burden than it is for me to try to get you to get my burden. See? And that's where many times we fail. We think everybody ought to have our burden. Same. Now, you ought to have some burden. It ought to be to do something because God has gifted you to serve him. And that's why. So in Romans chapter four, or 12 and verse 4, for as, as, uh, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another. If you look down at uh, in uh, verse 5, Verse 5, so we being many are one body, and once again, everyone members of one another. Now, the point that we're, we're going to be looking at here is that no man or woman can say that I am independent of the body of Christ. And that's where we, that's where we sin. See, we, uh, we get this idea that I'm a Christian, but I'm going to be an independent Christian, and I don't have any obligation or any responsibility to the body of Christ, or what can that church do for me? The right attitude ought to be, what can I do for the body of Christ? What can I do? What can I do to help somebody else? And by the way, if you get the attitude, what can I do to minister to the rest of the body of Christ, your own personal needs will be met. But as long as you are looking for trying to get your own needs met, they'll never be, you'll never be satisfied. Because right. people are always going to let you down. So then, 
not all members have the same, same office there in verse 5. And uh, they don't have the same function. We have gifts differing according to the grace. If you look at chapter 12 and verse 6, he says, having then gifts differing, differing. My gift, if anything, is past preaching and teaching. Pastoring and teaching. I don't do much of anything else well. I'm not a very good carpenter. I tried to build the building, put it together, but I look at the side. A real carpenter looks at it, and he just shakes his head and walks off. You see? But I never claimed to be a real carpenter. I don't, never made any claims. And then when I got through, I, 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 I wanted to hide. I'll never forget, uh, Brother Eric, when we built this, built this place. We've got trusses hanging overhead here. They are 77 feet long. And these trusses are 12 feet apart, the span. They are made from 6 by 12s or 6 by 14s, 6 inches thick and 12 to 14 inches high. We bought them in the rough. We bought steel plates and got a welding torch. And out here in the parking lot, we cut the steel plates. We got a drill, drill holes this big through the ends of those. No wonder the building department would, was going crazy. You know, I thought they were all a bunch of communists trying to stop me, you know. <laughs> those guys went nuts. But anyway, so we would drill, you know, drill those holes, cut the holes in those plates, got bolts this big around, this long, bolted those things together, brought a crane in, and lifted those trusses and set them on those six-by-six six posts. And, of course, a couple of them are off. So if you look right down the hip of the building, it'll do this. If you look down the fascia board on the side where the gutters are, they, they do this. It's like, you, as a matter of fact, if they had enough slope, you could do some white water rafting in them. Because, uh, I mean, they go like this. And uh, I didn't know what I was doing. But we got it done. I mean, tell you what, I'd rather, I'd rather find a guy who doesn't know what he's doing and get it done than a bunch of folks that know what they're doing and won't do it. I got tired of professionals sitting around not doing anything. Amen. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it if it's wrong. We're going, I'm going to do it. See? And uh, so, so we build it. And uh, you haven't been wet yet. You know, it, uh, it leaks a couple of spots. And a matter of fact, it leaks bodies through there occasionally. There's been <laughs> two or three. Two or three bodies come through there. So you don't want to get up there wandering around. You will be down here in the, in the pews. But um, in our text, verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us. I never, uh, I never imagined myself as a choir director or a contractor or a carpenter uh, or a printer or a high on mercy, or uh, peacemaker. Uh, I wish I was those things. I honestly do. I wish I didn't offend people the way I do. I'm, uh, you know, I can't help it. I'm just crude. I didn't have good training. But, uh, but I thank God that some of you are very merciful toward me. You know, I need you so that somebody doesn't kill me. Having then gifts, having then gifts according to the grace that is given us. You notice if you have any gifts, if you're high on mercy, thank God for it. And some of you are. You, you are. You, you're just, you're, I mean, you'd pick up stray cats and stray dogs and you take people, you pick up people and take them home with you and feed them and wash them and, and good for you, not me. I see some guy hitchhiking, I say, Get a job, commie! <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but I don't take them home with me, but some of you guys do. You take them home, you know. Now, I do help folks I, every once in a while, but, but some of you, I mean, that's just your life. You are. And I thank God for you. I, but, but don't expect me to be like you. You need me. You know, you need me to kind of rough you up every once in a while. But I need you. I need you <laughs> to help me when I'm in trouble. 
I, Gary Jacobs, one of the finest guys, I used to, I'd get upset, and I'd call him, and he'd talk for me for about two hours. And he'd talk, and he'd talk, and I'd talk, and I'd say, man, I, I appreciate you. He'd listen. He'd listen. I need guys like that. And, uh, but, you know, it just, he's, he's a peacemaker. You see. Blessed are the peacemakers, but not everybody's that way. Because some of us are some troublemakers, we need the peacemakers. Really. Some guys are teachers. Some are not. See, you can be a teacher without being a preacher, but you cannot be a preacher without being a teacher. Preacher must be apt to teach. But teachers aren't aren't, don't have to be apt to preach. You can be a good preacher and not be a pastor. I was telling... Some of these guys the other day, I says, there's a world of difference between preaching and pastoring. Some of the best pastors are not the best preachers. Some of the best preachers are not good pastors. So in our text then, he says in verse 6, and having gifts differing according to the grace that is given, uh, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Our ministry, verse 7, our ministry let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, or he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, or he that ruleth administration with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. You see the variety of gifts within the body of Christ in that verse? Now that's what frustrates and that's what causes trouble within a church is when we think everybody ought to be just like us. There are folks in this church that are not, everybody ought to have mercy, but not everybody is high on mercy. Everybody ought to be a soul winner, but not everybody's a good soul winner. There are exceptions to the rule, right? Everybody, everybody ought to teach some, but not everybody is gifted to teach. Everybody ought to be ready to preach, but not everybody is gifted to preach. Everybody ought to give, but not everybody has the burden or the ability to be a great giver. You get the picture? I mean, there are some folks, they love giving. They're, they just give all the time. They give anonymously. They give large. I had somebody tonight to give me, uh, for, some, for, some, for somebody, a, a, large, a large amount of money to help somebody. They don't want the person to know. You see what I'm getting at? That's one person. This church has 400. Would we expect all 400? It'd be good. I just don't expect it, and then I'm not disappointed. I just don't expect everybody to have that burden. I wish you did, but I certainly wouldn't fault you if you don't. So then having gifts differing. Uh, now failure to appreciate this point that the gifts are different uh, certainly, as I said, can cause some real problems within a, within a local church. And uh, the reason your body is structured the way it is is it is made to accomplish tasks. The way you are made physically, God made you physically for a specific purpose. Do you ever wonder why most men have broader shoulders than women? Because God has structured them for hard physical work. That's right. Man is a, supposed to be a provider. He's supposed to get a club and go out and kill a mountain lion and bring it home to Jane, you know. But uh, God, has, God has equipped people differently for the work that he calls them to do. And uh, the body of Christ then is structured to accomplish the works of evangelism. There's enough folks in this church to win hundreds of people to Christ. Could win hundreds. And uh, then the, the ability to edify, to build up others. There's folks to do that. 
and giving this church within this church there's all the money that is needed to do everything this church ought to do there's enough money in this church to do everything this church ought to do You're a little quiet but I know it's there I know it's there I know in the average church about 20 percent of the people give 80 percent of the money and that's true in any church. 20% of the people give 80% of the money. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. But that's not the way it ought to be. Everybody ought to be doing something. And uh, when, people are expected, when people are expected to do the same thing, then, of course, uh, there are other things that go undone. Now, every function is crucial to the operation of the body of Christ. No one can say that their roles are not important. Uh, if you turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul illustrated this. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12 and uh, <clears throat> notice what he says in verse 15. Chapter 12 and uh, verse uh, 15. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the head, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the uh, ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the body, if the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? And if the whole body were hearing, where's the smelling? Say, but God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. Now, you know why churches have trouble? One of the major reasons that every church has problems is there is a member in the body that hasn't found his or her place within the body, and they want somebody else's place. You understand? His function is not yours' function. His function is His, and yours is yours. You, uh, Brother Jim, I heard you talk about on the SWAT team, the reason guys get killed is they won't cover their area. They're trying to cover for somebody else. And uh, that's what happens in a church sometimes. Um, folks have not figured out where their place of service is. And so they just want to, you know, be the eyes of the whole thing or the ears of the whole thing or the feet of the whole thing. You can't be that. You have to figure out what is your function in the body of Christ and then work in that area. And uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the roles are important. They, they, uh, but some folks think, you know, well, what I have to do is not important, but it is. Could you imagine your foot saying to your hand, I'm just tired of being a foot. Nobody ever shakes me. Really? Not only that, you put a ring on the hand. You don't have any rings on me. In fact, what you do is you put a sock over me, and then you stick me in some leather, and you wash your hands ten times more than you wash me. I mean, Check me out. I stink. I'm tired of being a foot. Well, I'll tell you what, when your foot gets tired of being a foot, the whole body's in trouble. The whole body suffers. And that's what happens within a church. Somebody has not found out exactly why God has created them and why they've been put in the body of Christ. And uh, they start stinking. And they start become a thorn in the flesh for the rest of the body, you see. Because they cannot find their own place. And that's what goes on, and that's what causes trouble in churches. It's basically it. 99% of the time, as Brother Pete said, it's just frustrated ambition on the part of a member of the body of Christ to be either in an area that he or she's not supposed to be. Nobody's standing in your way of serving God. 
Matter of fact, I'll grease the runway for you. I'll hand you all the literature you need. I'll give you a classroom. I had a guy one time, he wanted to do something. I sat right here with him. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a classroom over here. No, I was the fireside room. I said, I'll give you the fireside room. I'll, give, I'll print the literature for you and give you everything you need. Just go build a class. Next Sunday, he was gone. I guess he wanted me to go out and get the people for him. Yeah. See? Nobody's standing in your way. Just go do it. Nobody's stopping you from building a bus route. Just build one. Just get some mad. You'll say, I'll show him. I'll build one. Nobody's stopping you from winning souls. Nobody's stopping you from building a Sunday school class. You're just alibying. Just find out what God wants you to do, what you're gifted to do. You come to one of these pastors and say, look, give me the training I need. He'll give it to you. Amen? I know he will. I know they will. And so, uh, the, uh, no one can say that uh, he's not important. Matter of fact, when you say you're not important in the body of Christ, you don't realize it, but you're complaining against God. Let me tell you what. I don't think for a minute that I'm any more important than this guy. I don't. I'm not. I'm not any more important than him. God loves him as much as he loves me. He's washed in the same blood I'm washed in. He and I are bone of bone and flesh of flesh. We both belong to Jesus. We just have different jobs. That's all. He's going to help me do my job. I'm going to help him do his job. That's all it is. Amen? Amen. There's no competition. I'm here to help him. He's here to help me. We're here to help you. You're here to help us. And they're here to help you, and you're here to help them. And when we get that picture, we start functioning as a body. Then the feet say, hey, I'm content to be feet. I'll help carry the body. Well, that's a pretty important job. The fellow says, I'm just tired of being the left hand. Well, try washing the right one without the left one. See? Which wing on an airplane is the most important, Jason? The right wing or the left wing? I guess right wing for us. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. A little political thing there. But anyway. I mean, when you're flying to Hong Kong there, brother, both of those wings better be flopping at the same time. Amen? And if one of them falls off, it doesn't care which one it is, you're in trouble. So the same thing with your hands and the body of Christ. There are some of you that you're, you're, you're given to service and, and uh, like you said, carpentry and cleaning the church and doing things of that work, doing things of that nature. You may not get the attention, the appreciation, and the, and the applause that, that you ought to have. But I guess the best thing, the attitude is to say, look, I'm doing it for Jesus. And when I get to heaven, I'll get my praise. Because if you, you know, and we ought to thank people. We ought to recognize people. But if you, if you expect it and think you have to have it, you're going to be disappointed and you're going to get bitter and you're going to quit. See? Now, this places uh, several challenges before us when we think about that God has equipped you exactly the way he wants you to be equipped. He's placed you in the body, and he has a purpose for you. There's no such person that is not gifted for the body of Christ. When you got saved, he put you in his body. But we need to be aware that there are different ways that we can serve. And then we need to encourage members all members, to develop their abilities, uh, which be, uh, to develop themselves to, their, to best suit their abilities. And then, of course, we have to provide direction. And that's what we want to do. If soul winning is your burden, then you ought to get with a soul winner and learn how to win souls. You ought to read books on soul winning. Read good books on soul winning. Read good books. Buy, listen to good tapes on soul winning. Curtis Hudson and Jack Hiles and, and uh, Carl Hatch. 
I mean, anything you can get and read by these men on soul winning, you ought to get. If you want to build a bus route, you ought to get anything you can from Jim Vineyard on the bus ministry and from, who's that other? Wally Beebe and learn from men who are building bus routes, if that's your burden. If Sunday school teaching is your burden, you ought to read books on how to build a good Sunday school class and how to be a good teacher and enrolled in the teacher training class. You get the picture? I don't know what your burden is. I don't know what your gifts are. But I guarantee you, you've got them. Everybody here. Now, a fellow says, well, what if I, Pastor, what if I honestly don't know? What if I really don't know? Then I think you ought to sit down with Pastor Rich, Pastor Kelly, or myself, and we need to talk. And we need to put before you a list of possible things that could be done in the body of Christ and then go through a process of elimination. You say, no, I don't think I'd be interested in that. I don't think I'd be interested in that. I sat down with a family the other day. They had filled out one of these let me uh, help forms on uh, uh, open door opportunities. The <laughs> husband and wife did the same one. They checked the bookstore, the resource library, and construction. So I took them out uh, last Sunday night, spent some time with them. And uh, she said, construction? You can't even drive a nail. <laughs> he said, I don't know why I checked that. And we sat there and talked for a while. And uh, I talked to him about the bookstore, talked to him about the resource library. And you know what? Before it was over, they said, you know, do you think we could teach? I said, I don't know if you can or not. I think you can learn. We talked some more. I said, what age group would you think you'd be interested in working with? Well, we don't want nursing. <laughs> I said, put her there. Thank God for those precious nursery workers. But uh, we don't want nursery. Zap, we X that out. They didn't want to work with adults. We just zap that out. And they said, God deliver us from teenagers. <laughs> so we zap that out. The only thing that's left is elementary. They said, I think that's what we'd like. They said, we th I think that's what we'd like. And finally, and they narrowed it down from the first grade to the fifth grade. And they want to work and they want to team teach, and uh, they want to be trained. Now, they may find out that they ought to be carpenters, I don't know. But you've got to start somewhere. You start somewhere. But you always leave an out for folks because we make wrong choices. And we need to make, let people graciously get out of those positions realizing that they're not a failure. They're not backslidden. We just made a wrong choice, perhaps, trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Does that make sense? Now, the body of Christ has many members, many, and all members have not the same function. And unless we as a church are able to minister to many different people, we are doomed to plateau right where we are. We are going to have to be able to be more diversified and reach more people and, and accommodate all the body of Christ. And we can and we should. And every function is crucial to the operation of the body of Christ. And uh, one fellow said, some congregations have been built around one particular kind of ministry or program. In those congregations, the only members who are really involved are those talking, uh, taking part in that one special program. But the church is a body. A body must have diversity if it is to survive. Evangelism, edification, benevolence, and worship are functions required of every local congregation. Successful congregational development requires a balanced program involving many areas of activity. So rather than us being judgmental uh, folks who don't want to work in the youth department. We ought to thank God that they want to work in some other ministry. And rather than being judgmental of those, I, you know, I, over last uh, several years ago I used to hear folks say, well, I think everybody ought to take their turn in the nursery. I never did believe that because I don't want to take my turn. That's right. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> 
I know one church where folks, they get frustrated, especially if you're trying to get workers. It's frustrating. And uh, in one church, they tried to pass a bill within the church. If you have infants, you have to work in the nursery. Well, now that'll encourage folks to come. I guess when you have teenagers, you have to work in the teen department. And when you get old, if you've got a senior citizen and a mom and a dad, you have to work in the senior citizen ministry. You understand? Not everybody ought to work in the nursery ministry. Not everybody ought to work in the teen ministry. Not everybody ought to be a carpenter. Not everybody ought to be custodians. Not everybody ought to be teachers. Not everybody ought to be in the sound room equipment. Not everybody ought to be in the bus ministry. But everybody ought to be in something that God has equipped them for. And we ought, to, we ought to minister to those people. We ought to minister to them and help them. We ought to enable them. Give them the tools. Give them the training. Give them the encouragement. And get out of their way. Because I find that most folks are more gifted than we are anyway. Amen? I'm amazed at the ability that people have to do the work of God. All right, let's stand together. And we'll be uh, dismissed in a word of prayer. If you're here tonight and you're not involved in uh, serving the Lord in some way, you ought to be. Uh, you college students come home for college, uh, you ought to get involved in a ministry. You ought to roll up your sleeve and get busy serving the Lord, uh, teaching a class, going to soul winning, working in the bus ministry. Amen? You ought to be serving the Lord. And if you're here tonight, you're not a member of a church, you're not saved, you're not baptized, then you ought to take care of that business. But you are saved to serve. Amen. Everybody. Did you know the Bible says you're saved by grace through faith, but you're not saved by works, but you're saved unto good works. Unto good works. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of knowing Jesus as our Savior. We thank you for those down through the years who have worked in their area of ministry. I thank you, Lord, for those mentors who have helped me. I pray for uh, the church here. I pray for this body that, Lord, we will grow and mature and develop and seek uh, godly training and uh, learn not, and not only be equipped but learn how to equip others for the work of the ministry. I pray should there be one here that's unsaved tonight, or someone who needs to get baptized or join this church or surrender for the ministry, that they'll come and let God have his way in their life. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. What are we singing, brother? Number 309. Number 309. If there's a decision you need to make, you need to come and get things taken care of right now. Number 309. Let God have his way. Come on. You have longed for sweet peace and for, and for faith, faith to, to increase. increase. And have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until, until all, all the altar is laid. Altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Never be blessed. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you heal him your body and soul. Keep singing, let God have his way. Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always? You must do his sweet rest. before we sing this last stanza let me tell you a true story that illustrates what we're trying to say tonight a few years ago there was a deaf man who came to this church 
I think his name was Bob Bill. Bob, the deaf man was uh, paralyzed, or what was he? What? Sir, what? Okay. And the problem is the his 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 body would not cooperate with.